main justification of Russian invasion to Ukraine by Vladimir Putin and his surrounding is to liberate Russian population in our country and denazify our government which sounds absurd here i met with my friend uh, maria she is from odessa let's try to find out with the help of maria does she really need to be liberated and uh, what is the uh, relation to this situation from the russian speaking population of ukraine hello hello nice to see you welcome in lviv nice to see you too how are you doing I'm fine. It will be hard for me to speak English, but I will try to show you my uh, opinion on this topic. You are doing great. Okay, it's, let's try. I really appreciate this. So, you were born in Odessa. Yes. Odessa is the predominantly Russian-speaking city. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about predominantly not like 50 or 60 percent, it's like 95. Yes, yes, uh, because uh, I've started to learn uh, Ukrainian only in, in school, maybe, yes. And uh, first time when I was in uh, the city Sumy, which is on the, near Kharkiv, and um, I was 16, and that, that was the uh, first time when I heard uh, Ukrainian Surzik. And for me it was shocked. For those who doesn't know, Surzik is the natural evolution of language in a bilingual areas of Ukraine. So this is kind of like a combination of Russian and Ukrainian phrases which naturally developed through, uh, through centuries, yes? And in many places in central eastern Ukraine, people still kind of maintain the Surzik dialect. Uh, even though I am native to Lviv, I'm like 100% Ukrainian speaker while uh, like so understood uh, first time you heard Surzik but you never heard Ukrainian language before or what? Uh, I heard Ukrainian language but it was um, something from literature something from my uh, teachers in, at school something from the books something from the books yes uh, okay it was uh, 90s uh, so on that time in Odessa I don't know, really 95% uh, of people were speaking Russian. So, so it's fair to say that uh, your reality in which you grew up was like absolutely Russian. We are talking about Russian music, Russian culture, friends who speak Russian, Russian advertisement on the street and so on. While for me in Lviv, it was 100% Ukrainian. Like I never talked actually Russian mm -hmm. until I, uh, you know, started traveling. Mm -hmm. uh, and I met some Russian people and these like phrases that I got from the news, mm -hmm. f f from the media, I started to apply, of course, with many mistakes. And when I speak Russian somewhere in the world, nobody believes me I'm from Ukraine. They, they think that I am uh, like a Swedish guy who learned Russian very well. <laughs> Can you believe it? Okay. Because for many people, like they meet somebody from Odessa or from Kyiv, uh, they're Russians fluent. But now when Russian is getting better, uh, so this like one perspective, yes, in, in which reality Ukraine was living for quite some time. And another very interesting situation, for example, you were living in Kyiv for quite some time. Yeah. Ten years. This is a melting spot, the capital, where people come for work, for other reasons, all around the country. And there, like you have Ukrainian speaking people, Russian speaking, somebody is Surzik. For example, your husband is from Volyn, is the area in Western Ukraine, and he's a, a Ukrainian speaker, right? Yes, totally. He uh, speaks Russian with accent. With so, accent. accent, yeah, like me. Like, yeah, like you, he doesn't speak Russian. So, how did you speak at home before like, the war started? I, <laughs> I was speaking uh, Russian and he uh, Ukrainian. It was okay, normal for us. And uh, I have a lot of friends who were uh, uh, speaking only Ukrainian. Maybe even the most of my friends from Kyiv. But for me, I don't know, um, all my life I was okay. I'm. I love my country. I'm. I think that I'm patriot. But with my with my relatives, with all of them, with my parents, I speak Russian. So I. So thought all my life that it's okay to speak Russian in Ukraine. It's n not a problem. I had, I had no problem with this. And now for me and uh, 
I think a lot of people in Eastern Ukraine, it's shock that we need some uh, liberty. Liber yes. They need to liberate, liberate you. They need yes. to save you, save, save you, you. Okay. Fr from the Nazi government in Ukraine. Okay, it's... Uh, <laughs> there is no reason to save us. It's uh, absolutely right. But I, I don't understand his l logic in that case that he uh, dist he is destroying all Russian-speaking cities in Ukraine now, and uh, all of that people now, even if they before war was not really an anti-Russian, now they all these people are okay they hate hate everything which is going on now in ukraine and of course uh, they hate uh, russia just think of it in the following way mexico is invading california to liberate spanish-speaking americans like can, can you tell like this so that's the situation and what is the most absurd like Okay, like if you want to go and save your people who speak the same language, like why the fuck are you destroying their cities? So uh, the result, which, which is the outcome of that, is that people in the East who were still like liberal towards the Russian point of view before the war, now are more nationals than we are here in the West. Of course, because they have bombs uh, and rockets in, in their homes home you know and uh, of course when you are sitting in shelter for two three weeks uh, when your city is bombed when your city is destroyed for I don't know somewhere 25 percent somewhere like in Mariupol 80 percent so how can you even think that you are <sighs> Common with no, Russian that's, that's not possible to tolerate. Uh, yes, no. no. Of course, even if you was tolerant before it, now you just now you can just hate them because you don't have another option. I would like to bring uh, the second reason that they're justifying on invasion Ukraine, which is denazifying Ukraine. And uh, you are from Odessa. Mm -hmm. Odessa is famous to be the hub of a Jewish population of, of the entire area. Yes. yes, I traveled to America many times. In New York, there is the entire uh, district in the south of Brooklyn called Brighton Beach, yes. which has a namesake, Little Odessa. Like, there are a lot of people of Jewish origin who are from there. Our president is Jewish. I know, maybe, do you have some Jewish uh, roots or connections since uh, you're I, from Odessa? I, I have Bulgarian roots, but um, when you're from Odessa, I think uh, you can find uh, some <laughs> Jewish roots in everyone. I think so, so I don't know, actually. So, so, so what can you tell about denazifying Ukraine? Like, did you see any Nazi running around, like, mm -hmm, doing this or, or not? They sent uh, rockets to Babi Yar. It's very good, perfect decision to denazification. Really, yeah? Uh, I don't understand this logic. Obviously, there are no any traces of like significant uh, Nazi policy presence in Ukraine. And even if there are some far-right uh, organizations, none of them is represented on the higher level in the parliament, none of them represented on any uh, local uh, city councils and uh, like authorities. So, so this like doesn't have any kind of political presence here. So I just met my friend Vlad. Vlad, nice to see you again. Nice to meet you. Vlad is one of the most popular Ukrainian travel bloggers and he is originally from Kharkiv. So let's try to figure out what happens there. So tell me like the story, like how did you go through the start of the war? Well, uh, I was lucky enough to be not in Kharkiv when it all started. I was in Carpathians. I was shooting one of my new travel videos mm -hmm. and uh, I woke up from a phone call at 5 a.m. And uh, my girlfriend told me that uh, our neighborhood is being bombed. Ooh. So they saw uh, the explosions, the actual explosions, like on the horizon, coming closer. So she grabbed our cats, she grabbed, uh, grabbed all this stuff, the emergency bag, because for the last two weeks we had uh, stuff packed mm -hmm. in case of this. Ah, so you were preparing for the war even for two weeks before it actually happened? Not, uh, like, not preparing. 
But uh, you were like on alert? Not on alert. We just had a uh, bag packed with uh, necessary stuff we, uh, that was ready to be easily ah. packed with all the other stuff and uh, get going. We knew what, where the documents are, we knew where the money are. Mm -hmm. We were prepared, but not, we were not de expecting this, definitely. Okay, okay. Because everyone was uh, saying that everything's going to be fine, but just in case, just in case, be prepared. Okay. So that's what we did, that's why we had this bag. So she grabbed the, uh, the bag, she grabbed cats and uh, uh, along with her friends, she uh, jumped on a car and went straight to the western part of Ukraine. You are talking like this very morning, the very morning on the 24th? Well, yes, of yes. They started at, wow. it started at 5 a.m., at 4 a.m., 5 a.m. and they uh, left Kharkiv at 7 a.m. Oh, wow. So they yes. like really reacted pretty fast. Yes, because, uh, yes. my mother, uh, she was not as fast. I offered her to join them. But she told me that uh, she would rather stay and wait till everything comes down. But after a week of bombing, when it mm. uh, was getting harder and harder, she finally decided to go. And she like uh, she was very lucky to uh, catch a train because it, it's, it's one uh, of those evacuation trains. Yes, and it, it's very uh, it's very hard in Kharkiv because uh, people. Uh, the Kharkiv is uh, the second biggest city in Ukraine mm -hmm. with 1.5 million people mm -hmm. officially and uh, unofficially there are lots of refugees from Donbass mm -hmm. so it's huge a lot of people there okay. and all of those people who don't have their own cars are packing into the railway station and uh, huge lines huge crowds and she was very lucky to uh, dive into one of those tunnels to the other platform where uh, the train was arriving soon. So people were panicking and they were just stuffing into the main hall and nobody was using those tunnels. And mm -hmm. she was lucky enough to go there. Uh, she was lucky enough to catch a train and have a seat. So oh, wow. she was very lucky to be sitting during this trip because... How long uh, did it take? Uh, like almost uh, a whole day almost uh, like 20 hours so 24 she 24 hours mm, a little bit less than that considering the situation it's not bad it's not bad it's not yeah. bad at all uh, she was sitting she was uh, like inside a cart not outside because mm -hmm. people were actually sitting in the corridors in the hallways and uh, she arrived here we have relatives here in Lviv and uh, they offered her a place to stay so okay. we were lucky enough we, with this expert and I'm like I'm happy that she's safe now Okay. Yeah, okay. So, well, how long for your girlfriend? How long did it take to drive? Because Kharkiv, guys, it's approximately 1,100 kilometers from Lviv, and even during the best possible scenarios, without any traffic and a peaceful time, it takes it takes like at least 15 hours of driving. So it took them two days. Oh. Uh, so it was one full day of driving from Kharkiv to the central part of Ukraine, mm -hmm. to Vinitsa. So they didn't take the Kyiv route? No, 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 okay. not at all, because it's uh, the only safe route in the first day, it was through the central part of Ukraine. Okay. You okay. could not go through Kyiv because it was bombed as well. Uh, you could not go through south and it's, it, it doesn't make not. any sense. Yeah. yeah. So you go through central Ukraine, a lot of traffic jams because we don't have uh, autobans, we don't have... Correct. The big, infrastructure high... is not ready for this yes. uh, amount of traffic. They had uh, several very severe traffic jams on their way. I was uh, like guiding them online. I was finding a place to stay for them. So mm -hmm. booking.com, Airbnb, everything packed uh, during the first hours. So I had to find through my connections, through my friends, I, I could find one house in a village where they could stay overnight. Mm -hmm. So they spent a day, like 24 hours, a whole day uh, driving there. Mm -hmm. And then another 24 hours to drive to Carp Carpathians. Okay. It's, it's, it was one hell of a ride. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's crazy. So where is she now? Uh, she's now uh, in Carpathians uh, on uh, one of the resorts. Resort, one of the ski resorts. Where is a big amount of hotels which yes. are able to accommodate people. Yeah. And actually they are not accepting any more people now because uh, they are limited on supplies, okay. on food supplies. They're limited in a uh, number of rooms and uh, they're not accepting men there mm -hmm. and uh, they, were only, they were only accepting uh, women and children. Mm -hmm. So. That was the uh, that's the story the policy the policy of the resort. Oh wow, guys! Yeah, and this is just the story of one family. So you can imagine how overloaded this area is at the moment, and we will continue to to share the stories of our people of all the sufferings and you know all these like terrible things they had to go through. 
And also, if you want to follow, I highly recommend you and encourage to subscribe for the Vlad channel. At the moment, it's only uh, in Russian language, but I told him that uh, you, your friends, need more pure, trustful information in English. So by this time you will see the video, Vlad would already will have his first English language uh, edition. Let's see. A link will be below, of course. So when the war started, it was a big impact on you, on your mm -hmm. personal life, on your vision of the world, as I understand, mm -hmm. and on your profession, because Maria is a professional blogger, actually one of the most popular travel bloggers in Ukraine, and a great inspiration for me personally, because you are doing <laughs> a great you. job. Yeah. Thank you. So please subscribe, guys. You told me that you decided to completely change to start speaking Ukrainian language. Uh, yes, and I've already started and now I'm making my first video in Ukrainian. This is uh, something that I just uh, uh, feel I need to do. Just my position. I don't uh, see other option for me now. Because Was it a hard decision for you? Because uh, you already invested so much time, so much work into your previous work. And now you, you know, like, first of all, the, large portion of your audience is going away yes, which is like one question vision. probably yeah. not very it's uncomparable on importance in current situation but also it requires for you to adapt to do something absolutely new yes but uh, okay before it i uh, worked as a journalist so for me it's not a new thing to make a video in ukrainian uh, because I have such an experience to do, make a video uh, in Ukrainian because uh, I was a journalist on TV, uh, Ukrainian TV. And um, now I just need to change something. For me, it, it isn't okay, very easy because um, I still think in, in Russian, but I hope that one, two months and uh, I will start to think in Ukrainian and to, it will be easier for me. Why do you think it's important? Uh, because I, I just uh, feel that I don't want to have something common with uh, Putin. I don't even want. Um, okay, I don't even want Russian people to understand me now because I've tried to speak with them. I've tried to um, make a video for uh, have a communication with uh, my Russian subscribers. Some of them uh, are very shame about everything is going on, but I see so much people who are not shamed, who are um, supporting their president, and I just don't want to have something common with them. And for me, the easiest uh, is uh, the easiest way to change and to um, stop communication just to, to to start speak ukrainian what we want to have in common is to be integrated into the global world and never before in the history a single country received such a tremendous support from the global society as ukraine is enjoying now so uh, another idea would be to start uh, you know, English language uh, media presence, uh, which will uh, help our friends abroad explain the situation what's happening in Ukraine. So, for example, that's why I actually started this English language YouTube channel uh, to speak, yes, to, to establish contact with my international network. And uh, maybe uh, for you, it also could be a nice idea how you can uh, continue uh, further developing your uh, blogging and journalism skills. What do you think about this? Uh, your English is very fine, by the way. <laughs> of course, I've thought about it and uh, I'm still thinking, but uh, okay, for me, it's much harder uh, to start uh, English channel on YouTube, uh, much harder than in Ukrainian. Uh, but uh, maybe one time, one moment, I will uh, decide uh, to do it, and it will be the new channel because uh, I think it's um, you need to diversify this uh, product because uh, uh, people who will look, uh, who will watch these videos, uh, it will be different people. 
Maria, I think this is a great idea. Of course, you have to think through this and develop. And guys, if you think it's a nice idea, please write down in the comments below some uh, uh, <laughs> words of inspiration for Maria uh, to, to tell, do you need another English channel from, from her or not? And in the meantime, I invite you to uh, subscribe and watch uh, the video of Maria that she just recently published about life of Ukrainian refugees abroad. It will be in Ukrainian language, but there will be English subtitles, correct? Yes, yes. So please follow, please check out and get like a truthful source of you from a Ukrainian nice uh, girl. Yep. Thank you. At this moment, I wish you good luck. Uh, thanks for watching this. I wish good luck to you. It was nice to see you. Stay safe. And uh, all the best, guys. See you soon. Bye.